Righteousness and justice are the pillars. They're the pillars of God's faith with us. Righteousness and justice. Because of in, in, in humanity's inability to keep covenant with God up until Jesus Christ, he had to solve the righteousness issue before he administered the justice issue. Because if he administered justice before Christ making us righteousness, it'd be time for something other than a flood, right? It'd be time for something else to wipe out humanity because nobody, nobody is righteous before God except through the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Lord solved the righteousness issue. He solved it for us. But it doesn't mean that it comes to us without obligations. Because reviewing what I began a couple weeks ago about covenant, covenant is more than a contract. It's more than just an agreement. It's about relationship. If we enter into covenant to pray for these people with them and God, that's relational. That's not a contract. Contracts can have no relationship whatsoever. Right? You could sell a car to somebody, you don't know them, maybe never see them. Right? You can buy a house, you meet them for a few minutes, you go to a closing, there's no relationship. But in the marriage covenant, it's all about relationship. And in the family covenant, it's all about relationship. In the covenant that we have as, as a family and a church together, we're in covenant and it's relationship. And it's relationship with the ministries that we're allowed to, to be joined to and the people that we're involved with. And in the kingdom service of God, it's all about relationship. It has nothing to do with the legalism of works. It has to do with relationship. And because of that, then the Lord says, now I can also be the one who administers justice. Because justice without righteousness is doom and gloom. But you have to stay in covenant with God. And so we see that, you know, even in our country, there's a teetering of justice. There's a teetering of justice. Now, the Lord's very clear. We're not going to make it about that sermon today. But Romans 1 and Romans 2, very clear about what the Lord looks for. Paul got it. Because Paul understood covenant before Jesus Christ. He was a covenant-keeping soldier for radical Judaism, Hebraism in that day, right? He was out trying to eliminate Christians who were a cult to him and who were a blaspheme of Adonai, the one and only God. He thought he was serving his faith the right way until he had his Damascus Way experience. And the Lord shook him up and took all that good stuff that was inside of him and said, now let me send you down to Syria, to Damascus, for about three years so you could sort this garbage out in your head. <laughs> and he went there. And, and, and he was able to disciple, to be discipled. And most of all, he was bathed in the Holy Spirit so that everything in the Word of God jumped out at him. And remember, there was no New Testament. There was no New Testament. And that's why he became the author of the majority of the New Testament, because he was seeking God and finding these treasures and jewels in the Old Testament and saying, that was the Messiah. That's about the new covenant. That's the new covenant with Jesus Christ. I've moved from that covenant into this covenant. And he would seek the Lord with a passion and desire and had the anointing to be able to bring it forth to us for the Pauline epistles, right? And they, they enlighten us. They, it's, like a, it's like a nuclear bomb going off in our heads and in our spirits and our souls. And all of a sudden, we're alive. And there's little explosions and implosions going on inside of us of the revelation of the kingdom of God. And we have the benefit of the full scriptures. When we cross over into the new covenant, we're not supposed to discard the law and the prophets. We're supposed to allow that to embellish us and fulfill us. Christ said, I've come to fulfill that. But he can't fulfill it if we reject it. But James had to deal with that too, didn't he? James had to deal with it and he had to say, faith without works is dead. And he said, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith with works. 
James got it. Because what was happening about that time was there were people that felt they didn't need to do anything else because they were saved in grace. And Ephesians tells us we are saved by grace. But we're not saved by grace to become doormats. We're not saved by grace to just become selfish and self-serving is what James called it. And Paul amplified it to the Corinthians, don't be self-serving. He said we're to give and to give generously. And that's why by the time I had a Pauline experience, I came out of the works, I came out of the law, I came out of sacrifice. I don't know too many people that were that radical like me. I did sacrifices on a farm in Hubbard all by myself, expecting to die if I didn't get it right. And so I understood it. And I had, I too, needed some time to sort it all out. It's like Galatians. Oh, you be bewitched Galatians. Who's taught you to go back into the law? It's so hard when you're coming out of the law, when you really practice the law. Not just saying, I, I was a Jew and I went to temple. Hey, <laughs> what really upset me there and pointed me towards the Messiah was nobody was practicing righteousness. The, I didn't see it. I didn't see the benefit of it. I remember the rabbi in the very last sermon before he threw me out of the temple, he was talking in the law. And he was in Leviticus. And, you know, the law was given in Leviticus. And what you do if, 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 if you kill or injure your neighbor's bull, right? And, and, and what it said in there was you've got to give him a new bull. And you've got to make recompense. And so he turned that around and made it a, an analogy about a Cadillac. If you crush somebody's Cadillac or smash it, he said, you've got to get them a new one if you can't fix the old one. I'm thinking to myself, I'm getting here in an old Oldsmobile that barely drives. I've got wipers that don't work. And you know, Cadillac? I'm going to hit somebody's Cadillac and give them a brand new one. I can't even afford shoes. What's he talking about? And then I realized that something was wrong, really wrong with the message. And that all my works wasn't working out. And so what Paul and James realized is, as, as the, the Jewish believers, remember, those were, those were your, they weren't called Christians then. They were called believers. Messianists. A cult. And they were, they were gravitating towards faith without works. And so what it meant was they just keep it to themselves. And beginning to apply and take all of the promises of the covenants, which there's many, we'll go over just a few of them. And they would take them and claim them for themselves, but without saying this is in relationship with the body of Christ or with the unbeliever. So James said, hey, let me wake you up. Faith without works is dead. And he said the body without the spirit is dead. That's how he equated it. He made it so strong that he said to them, you're enjoying the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You're enjoying the blessings of the Spirit. Well, guess what? Your faith has no spirit in it if it's without works. Show me your faith without works. Let me show you mine with works as unto God. And so we understand, but we need to be reminded that righteousness and justice are the pillars of God that stand in the new covenant. Christ was made sin, who had never sinned, so that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that word made doesn't mean it's cultural. It's not a diploma. It's not a certificate. It's not something that you wear in your sleeve. It's inside. It's your soul, it's your persona, it's your spirit. It's everything that you are. Everything that you were before giving your life to Jesus and asking him to forgive your sins and being washed by his eternal blood, which is the sin atonement, your, your character, your makeup, your being was sin. You can say, but I, I you can make all the excuses you want. You know how many people are going to try to make that plea to God when they're in front of them and they've rejected Christ? I don't want to be there to watch that day. I'm sure I'll be in heaven 
Lord willing, I'm there. You know, I'm, I'm not going to fall away from the Lord. That I won't do. And I know that that merited grace, unmerited grace is the redemption in Jesus Christ. I got that part down. And I know I'm made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. I got that part down. You got it too. But one of my prayers is, Lord, I don't, I don't want to see the judgment seat. Let me worship at the throne room. I don't, I don't want my heart ripped out to watch people being rejected of God. I don't know about you, but to me, that would be hell in heaven. I prayed that. I'm radical. I say, Lord, I, I don't even want to be part of that judgment. I don't want to judge those people. I, I have to defer that to you. I, let, me, let me play piano with Sonny and Leanne and Jeff. Let us Give us some new instruments, stuff we've never seen before. Let us worship the Lord through that ugly scene of God. And it will come. So we've been made the righteousness. And because we've been made the righteousness now, we have the right to justice. And we have the right to a justice that is fair and equal. Now we go back to Romans 1 and Romans 2. Paul made it very clear what was considered unrighteousness to believers. He went through a whole litany of it. Part of it was being selfish. Part of it was not giving. Lying, deceiving, adultery, stealing. Men having passions for men. Passions for wives falling away. Beloved, that's sin. Doesn't mean we hate the sinners, but it means we call sin, sin. Killing the unborn, that's sin. That's sin. We love those. And how many people, male and female, have participated in abortion that have found redemption and release at the cross? It's no different than any other sin. Listen to me. There's not such thing as levels of sin. <laughs> sin that's not washed in the blood is enough to keep you out of heaven. Any sin that's washed in the blood is enough to get you into heaven. Sam Berkowitz, 1980, 1981. I prophesied, son of Sam was going to be saved. I didn't have any idea, along with some other names. Son of Sam is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in death row. He's given freedom in the prison to go hold Bible studies. Killed 13 women in the park said so a dog was talking to him. I believe a demon was talking to him. He believes a demon was talking to him because he's been washed in the blood. And he's asked the Lord for his forgiveness. I believe he get it. I think Brother Sam, I'm going to see him in heaven. And he never goes before the board, whether they let him out or not. He says, no, I'm called here. I'm called here to these people to show them that God can do something with a man like me. He said, I'm not called out there. This is where I belong. And he said, I'll give my last breath serving the Lord on death row and to the worst of the worst of the criminals. That's what Jesus does. Justice. Justice. The justice of man says kill him. The justice of God says this life isn't going to be the one that determines you now. I've got your soul. Justice. And the scales of justice for a nation lay in what we do with the righteousness and the laws of God, not the laws of man. Man can legislate anything they want, but if it is not aligned with the law of God, then we're not those who are supposed to say that's what determines who I am. I'm not calling people to arms. I'm not calling anybody to take anything up physical. What I'm calling to do is to preach and speak the word of God. And not to sacrifice what we know is of God because of political ideology. Listen to me strong. Because we're going to have to make those decisions in the next two years again in this country. We're going to have to decide how and who to vote for. I'm not saying don't vote. But you know what? Don't get caught up in any isms. Stay out of the isms. God says, 
And I'd like to call the scripture up in Micah 6. This is what God says. Not what I say. Micah 6. Let's go to verse 5 starting. You see, this is what? An Old Testament prophet. They call him a, a minor prophet. He didn't have the impact of an Isaiah and a Jeremiah, but he still spoke out to his people at the time. And he was speaking about the injustice of the people of faith who thought they were just going to go out and do sacrifices and be religious and go out and serve against God and live a life that was detestable. Because they were living within the law of the place they lived, maybe it was okay. And he says, O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, from Acacia, a grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. He's calling them back to righteousness. And what he's telling them is that those people that counseled with them, that they listened to Moab and Balak and Balaam and from wherever they went, because they had a big authority and a big government, he's saying, listen, they're wrong. And he's speaking out now as a rebel. He's speaking out now as somebody who's speaking against the political and social culture of the day, within that culture. Next verse. With what shall I come before the Lord? <laughs> he's saying it now to me. With what shall I come before the Lord? What shall you come before the Lord with? I bow myself before the Most High God. I'm bringing him something. I'm coming and bowing to him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old. I'm within the law. Next. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression and the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? The, listen, let that soak in the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Well, Frank, you don't understand. We, you know, we, we've, we've evolved. We've evolved. I mean, you know, young people are being born and somebody got it wrong. They, they have the biology of a male, but they, they have the, the, the mindset and the soul of a female. And they're choosing to be something different than their biology. And you just don't understand, Frank. They're coming out and these poor people have, have been downtrodden and abused and neglected and rejected. And now it's time for them to come out and to be respected against the law of God. And you've got to understand that, you know, no law can take over the control of a woman's womb. I, I, I'm a woman and I have the right to determine what happens to that which comes out of my womb. It doesn't matter what God's law is. And I have the right, I mean, you know, you don't understand, I've come out of a bad way. I don't have the stuff that you have. So I'm going to take your stuff. I'm going to smash and have a whole mob of people come in and do everything from potato chips to the money. And no one's going to arrest me because... It's really not that serious, and we have a right to take it because we need it, and it's not going to hurt the store after all. And then they get caught. There's no justice. Back out, not even a bail the same day. Do the same thing next week. Why not? Because man's law is changing it. But God's law says, such people shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Justice with righteousness. He really takes it down to the point of sacrificing the firstborn for a transgression. He's taking it back to the justice, the punishment on Egypt for God to let his people go. He's correlating the law, the covenants, next one he has shown you I like this one oh man it's like he has shown you man what is good huh now he's asking him 
Now the hood's coming out in him. What is good? What does the Lord want from you? He's making it pretty simple. He's getting in their face. But to do justly, but to do justly, but to do justly, to have justice. Do you know that one of the laws was that if you kidnap somebody and if you took that person and you put them into servitude to you, the Lord says as such a one is kill him. Woo. If that would have gotten preached during the 1800s, you wouldn't have had slavery. But that wasn't preached. Because the other law allowed people to be able to enable the fruits of their own soul against the justice of God and the humanity to people. Huh? You know, some people say our criminal justice system is too tough. I can tell you it's not always fair. It does lean unrighteously to privileged people. It absolutely does. If you don't believe that, you need to just read about it and understand it. And, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that hardcore criminals should be released and sex perverts back out to prey again upon innocent children. There has to be justice. He says, do justly, love mercy. You can be just and be merciful, right? You can be just and be merciful. I've said it many times, someone breaks into my house and they're armed, they're going down. But then I'm gonna be merciful on them. But they're going down. Because we're Christians and believers, it doesn't mean that we're passive to the point that we lay down the justice of God. The Lord was very clear in it. Very clear in it. And to walk humbly with your God. Walk is the same word as work. To work out your faith humbly with God. To walk with God means to do the things of God. But to do them with justice and mercy for other people. Generosity brings the favor of God. The covenant favor of God. The perils, the treasures. Those blessings. They're buried right there in the righteousness and the justice of God. You want the favor of God? Walk with mercy and justly before God. One other scripture, and we're going to go our way. Actually, two. Luke 4.18, please. I preached on this a little while ago. We're still dealing with the favor of God. We're just taking it. Because you know why? Because the favor of God is such a blessing to the body of Christ. And it's dealt with as if it's trite and small when it's all about the favor of God in our relationship with him. It's not about being religious. It's not about, it is about being secure in our salvation, but it's more than that. It's about having an abundant life in him and the favor of God in your life right now for every situation and everything. And for you to have a future that knows it's the favor of God. Listen to me, some of you need to hear this. I know it's hard, and the older you get and the more alone you are, you begin to get insecure. You begin to wonder, what about, and you see other people that are, you know, just pining away, and they don't think they have any. Listen to me. If you're walking in covenant with God, that's never going to happen to you. Let it hit hard. It's never going to happen to you. It's never going to happen to you. You're never going to be like a dog lapping the water out of a pond or a puddle. God will take care of you. I promise you that. Because you walk in the covenant favor of God. Don't let that overwhelm you. Don't let that bother you. Don't let it when you're up against the wall and you begin to wonder, is this going to change? Is this going to happen? Don't let it put you back. Keep remembering who you are. Walk. Walk in the Lord. Did we get uh, Luke 4.18, please? 
This is Jesus. Remember, it's out of Isaiah. He opened up, he read the scroll, he put it down because it hadn't yet come. But the time is. And in Luke 4, 6, he reads and he professes in the temple, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, Jesus, to preach the gospel to the poor, the good news. He has sent me to heal, to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, those who have addictions, those who are bound up in fear, those who are bound up in their history, those who are bound up in bad parental relationships, those who are bound up in bad spousal relationships, those who've been rejected, those we could go on, those who are addicted. He says, I've come to proclaim liberty to them. I've got a word. Beloved, you're that word now. You're the one preaching the gospel. You're the one who has the authority and the power to bring that word upon people's lives. Don't brand and label somebody by the experience of who they are right now. Brand and label them by the authority and the power of the word of God that's in you right now. Don't call them an addict, call them set free. Don't call them a drunk, call them one who's walking clear. Don't call them a sinner and foul. Call them somebody who is righteous in God, Jesus Christ. Declare unto them their new identity and declare it to the heavens and put it in your spirit. Believe it, repeat it, affirm it. How? In covenant with God. Not covenant with man. You're saying, but pastor, they're rejecting me. It doesn't matter. You have a covenant with God. And God keeps his word. And John 5, 15 tells it very clear. If you have the prayer for the one, the brother, who has not sinned the sin unto death, ask me for that soul and I will give it to you. I have stand on that. I've stood on it with my children, my children's children. I stand on it with my family. I stand on it with the people in this church. I stand on it with you, with your families. God will give you, he says, that soul. That's how much power and authority that you have because of your covenant relationship with God. Amen. Don't see what you see, don't hear what you hear, but see what you don't see and hear what you don't hear, because that's the faith. That's faith that's working. That's faith that walks in the Spirit of God. And the recovery of the sight to the blind, those who don't know Jesus, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Next verse. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I taught you a few weeks ago, acceptable is the favor of God. It is the abundant favor of God, the acceptable, the favorable year of the Lord. You have entered into that relationship, into that year, into that season with God. He's telling you to proclaim it. He's proclaiming it. Now walk in it. Oh. Walk in it. Come on. Walk in it. Not only do you have the Spirit of God with you, you're in the right place and time of God. Amen. It has all come together. It's merged together. And the Lord is telling you, you walk in that. Now finally, finally this. Would you please turn to Isaiah, starting in chapter 41, verse 10, Isaiah. Now, something very terrible and horrible happened a couple days ago. And an old man, 82 years old, had someone breaking into his wife who wanted, his house who wanted to kill his wife, Nancy Pelosi. She wasn't there. He was wise enough to dial 911 and leave his phone on so that they could hear what was going on. The police got there in two minutes right when the man was struggling with him for a hammer. When the police said to drop it, he instead began to beat him, cracked his skull, his arms and his hands. He was there to kill his wife, the speaker of the house. I don't know about you, but my first inclination was to pray for both of them. Thank God she wasn't there, and to thank God that the police got there quick, and that this 82-year-old man, somebody's father, somebody's grandfather, a woman's husband, that they would be able to put him back together again. 
Very interesting what came out of that. Some of it was disgusting. It became political. Both sides. All of a sudden, it's about the radicalness of the right. That man had nothing about being right. He was anti-Semitic. He was anything but right. He's just the same that anybody is. He's just a, a wicked, lost, embittered criminal. That's what he is. Can God save him? Yeah, I hope he gets sent to Sam. Sam got a word for him. That's where I hope he goes, right? Yeah, when I hear this stuff about these really bad criminals, I said, send him to Sam, Lord. Send him to Brother Sam. Send him to Brother Sam. Listen, this is what came out of the speaker yesterday. She quoted, and she said, thank you for your prayers. She said, I'm traumatized, and we're scared. I believe her. Traumatized and scared. Somebody breaks through your house and starts beating your spouse with a hammer. That's traumatic. That's a human being. That's a person. And she said, but we're gaining strength. I'm gaining strength on this promise of God that Isaiah spoke. This is what she quoted. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not despaid, be not traumatized, be not scared. For I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now go to verse 13. For I, the Lord, your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. That's what she turned to. I'm sure she's Catholic. I'm sure her pastor, her priest, ministered and tended to the family. And that's the word they got. That came out of the speaker's mouth. And you know what? That's a message we can hold on to. You know, my prayer is that we begin to hear these kind of messages out of all of these politicians up there. Amen. Fear not, for I, the Lord your God, will hold your hand. Fear not, I will help you. Out of the injustice comes justice. Out of the darkness comes light. Out of the pain and suffering comes redemption. Amen. That's what I saw out of that. And I said, Lord, let it soak in. Let it soak in. No, no, not just to her and her family. Let it soak in to everyone who has ears. That no matter who you are, there's a safety net because of the covenant of Jesus Christ. Because of the covenant of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you, Father, that you're a covenant-keeping God. And that you say, because of your covenant and your loving kindness, that you will never forsake us or leave us. How great your loving kindness is, as David cried out. How great it is when he finally yelled, Lord, you will never forsake me. You won't forsake us because of how great your loving kindness is. Your mercy, your just, your grace. We thank you for it. We bless you for it, Lord. Father, tattoo it within our spirits. Let us know, Father, that the favor of God is a new creation birthright in Jesus Christ. That we're not those who walk with our heads low. That's not humility. We walk with our heads bowed before you and lifted high in the presence and the power and the praise of God, knowing that victory is ours. Father, bless, bless and even each and every person here, old and young. Father, we entrust our youth to you. We thank you, Father, that you'll go with them always. No matter what they experiment with, no matter what they do, you will be with them. And they will know you're with them. And when the times come in their lives to make choices, that the Holy Spirit will be nudging and pulling at them. Father, we bless those who are online with us and we ask you to bless them and their families. 
And we thank you, Father, that for us in our house and there in their houses and all of our houses, that we shall serve the Lord. We thank you, Father, that there's no such thing as a generational curse now to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Those curses are broken and the promises of God are yea and amen. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be those who are afraid of what tomorrow brings because tomorrow is another day in your quiver. It's another gift to us of life. And you promise us an abundant life, oh God, not one that we have to worry about tomorrow. We thank you for it, Lord. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name.